So let's talk about how you actually build one of these things. We're going to look at a few topics. I know Andy really wants to talk about code generation. We'll make sure that, that we spend plenty of time there. Um, but we'll start with just talking about in-memory storage, transactions and concurrency control, uh, crash recovery and replication. We can kind of go over very quickly. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, and then code generation is really interesting, and distributed execution is also really, really interesting. All right, so in-memory storage. Let's first think about what does in-memory give you. So the first thing with memory is that you have insanely fast random reads and writes. That is kind of the defining thing about memory that makes it very, very different than a disk. The other thing that you have is very fast atomic writes. So you can compare and swap with the granularity of a single byte or even two bytes. Um, and you can do this very, very performantly. Doing this on a disk is, even an SSD, is prohibitively slow. Another thing is that the working space is precious. So like I said, RAM is still pretty expensive. Um, nowadays, you don't need to be so careful about how much data you store on disk, because uh, for a company to sort of double uh, the amount of disk that they have available to a machine is an extremely straightforward proposition. You can cheaply add disks in a RAID configuration. You can cheaply add volumes uh, on something like Amazon EBS, Elastic Block Storage. And you even have object stores that uh, run across the network, like Amazon S3 or HDFS, which are approaching the performance that you have with the locally attached disk. So getting more storage in disk is not that expensive. And it can actually even be done online. So it's, it's really easy to expand disk storage. But with RAM, it's not the case. It's pretty expensive. The last thing um, which we'll talk about in a reasonable amount of depth here is that in-memory storage gives you a very different set of advantages for row stores and column stores. And that's kind of because of the workloads that you use for row stores versus the workloads that you use for column stores. And so we believe that you should kind of think about these a little bit differently. So if we look at in-memory row stores, well, row stores have a lot of random reads and random writes. In fact, row stores are basically built to be very fast at random reads and random writes. Um, furthermore, data sets for row stores are usually pretty small. So row stores tend to track one row per item. Um, and these things tend to be less than 10 terabytes. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions. But for the most part, for most Fortune 500 companies, their row store workloads are less than 10 terabytes large. So the solution is to keep the whole data set in memory. Um, and if we keep the whole data set in memory, then we can actually use a data structure that's optimized very, very well for memory called a skip list. Um, and there are a number of advantages that we get by using this kind of data structure in MemSQL. So how many people here have heard of a skip list? I think, did you cover it in class? It, yeah. Awesome. So I'll skip through this. The big thing here is that there are no pages. So that particular detail is what enables you to implement a skip list lock free. And that's very, very significant. Um, here's a picture of a skip list, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. So what are the common concerns with the skip list? One of them is memory overhead. So you have to store all of these things. Um, now, here's kind of what it looks like in a B tree. So this is a clustered index and a non-clustered index. Uh, in a B tree, with a non-clustered index, you actually need to restore all of the columns uh, that you use in a non-clustered index, as well as some reference to the primary key, whether it's some sort of ID or all of the columns of the primary key. Um, and so you actually incur a lot of overhead in storing the values of those columns. Um, if you, for example, index a relatively large string, you need to store an extra copy of that string. That's expensive. Um, in MemSQL, what we can actually do is compress all of this information, because we know that it's all in memory, into the same struct that actually stores row data. So we know kind of at table compilation time or table creation time or even table alter time, how many columns are in the table and how many indexes there are. And we can, in memory, design the layout of a row to include not only the columns, but pointers to all of the relevant skip list towers. So if you think about that picture of a skip list, the base or the bottom sort of tower of the skip list is shared by every index. And the towers um, are different for, for each index. What that means is we don't have to pay the cost of storing columns again. Um, and we don't have to pay the cost of storing kind of those base level pointers again. And that saves actually a, a very significant amount of memory. Um, the other advantage is that the cost 
of going from a secondary index to data in a row is zero. Because once we find a row in a secondary index, we can simply cast to get to the primary key data. Reconfigure your table row memory layout every time you add it, add or drop an index. Yes, but we can do it online. Yeah, I know you yeah. Can do it yeah. It's not cheap. Um, it's not cheap. No, but it's not. It's it's not that expensive either. Right. Like, while it's happening online, you can continue to sort of read and write the table, and you can even read and write the table with the new columns. So it's it's uh, surprisingly sort of minimal impact. <coughs> Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So is this an abstract like representation of a table row, or like how do you add a new index? Like, if this is the definition definition of the structure, I don't know how do you add a new index? So this is not if you if you run MemSQL, we will and you create a table with two columns and two indexes, it will not literally look like this. Structure. Okay. okay. Um, but it's pretty close. Uh, okay. Now the way that. Uh, online alter works is that every row has a little bit of information. We kind of steal bits from different places. And when I say bits, I mean literally bits um, from various places in the row that we know um, aren't necessary for correctness. And we use those bits to store a little bit of information about which version uh, of the row it is. So when you run an alter, we know which rows have been altered and which ones haven't been altered. And on the fly, when we operate on rows which haven't been altered, we can semantically kind of fill in the things that you would need to alter. So for example, if you add a column, you must specify in, in most systems where you do something like alter table add column, you have to specify a default value for a column so that existing rows which don't have that column can automatically have that default value for a column. And so what we can do is we can say, OK, if there's an old version of the row, we can just kind of dynamically add that column value until the row is properly moved into the new format. I think we're saying that you can only do this in the way. You would not yes. do that Yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's kind of the point, yeah. So this makes a lot of assumptions, um, especially the fact that uh, all rows are represented exactly this way, and rows are glued together with pointers. Why can't you do this? Like, I'm not sure why you can't do this with this. Like this is basically, I don't know, database level like default value storage, right? Like, uh, so it's not whether or not you can do it with disk; it's whether or not you can do it online with disk. Yeah. And so, because this is re-stitching together uh, the 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 indexes as it goes, um, and operating on the lock-free skip list rather than taking kind of page locks uh, as as it goes and, and and manipulates rows, there are a few sort of weird cases that it covers. That are, uh, it's not impossible to do on disk, but very, very hard. Yeah, and in particular, it's very hard to get good performance if you're doing it on disk. So, if you have an online alter that's running and it's acquiring locks over several rows for any row that it needs to touch, um, it dramatically impacts performance uh, for concurrent reads and concurrent writes going through the table. In this case, the fact that we don't have locks per page basically enabled us to be a very lightweight. Uh, operation while a normal workload runs. Uh, another quick question: How often do you see it's it's hard to quantify it, but do you see a lot of alters happening? Uh, That's a great question. So um, a lot of people, especially kind of database implementers who or people who worked on databases for a while, say you know alter table is not that important because from my experience people never run alters. Uh, and it turns out that the reason they never run alters is that alters are so taxing and expensive to run on a database system. Um, and if you ask users to kind of blank sheet of paper what features really matter to you, they will write alter. And actually, if you give them online alter, they'll start running it all the time. So it's not uncommon for people to run alter table on a production cluster every day, which with a, a kind of a system that doesn't have online alter is extremely, it, that's, that's unheard of. It's usually, let me take down this thing and once a year have some downtime and, and run alters. Sunday, 3 Yeah. Um, all right. So the next thing is scan performance. Um, with skipless, you're, you're chasing pointers, whereas with a B tree, uh, you have this kind of nice locality. So this locality in a B tree is important because of disk. So you need to kind of write some page size and read some page size to disk so you avoid random reads and random writes. Um, but it also means that when you elevate this data in memory, rows are consecutive in memory. And so you get good 
locality and good scan performance. Um, if you think about a skip list, and this is kind of the bottom tower of a skip list, um, this is the logical layout of rows. So this is one row pointing to another row, pointing to another row. This might be what you'd expect the physical layout of these rows to be. So they're kind of spread all over memory. Um, and if only this much fits in a cache line, when you go from here to here, you have to invalidate the cache and load this in cache. So you kind of uh, take a cache miss. When you go from here to here, you go back here and, and kind of repeat this process over and over again. Um, and this can definitely happen to you if you sort of poorly implement a skip list. It turns out that you can actually fix the skip list in the background um, and apply a bunch of heuristics kind of as the skip list is recovered or inserted um, or written to at all to make the skip list look more like this. And if you do this, you get basically the same performance that you get with a B tree because you're chasing pointers um, but without ca cache misses. Um, so the scan performance is another sort of very common concern that people have with skip lists. It turns out that you can actually solve this problem as well. So is it, so you have a backup thread? Is it is like calling optimize in MySQL? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. It turns out that actually the heuristics take you most of the way there. So with heuristics and without background correction, you can actually end up for the most part like this. Um, and furthermore, the heuristics tend to align pretty well with the heuristics that you have to get a good looking B tree as well. So um, in practice, it, it turns out to be less of a problem than, than one might expect. Uh, so the next one is reverse iteration. So. Uh, as you saw from the picture of the skip list, the, at least the one that I drew, it's singly linked. Um, doubly linked skip lists, no one knows how to implement them lock free uh, because you kind of have to fix two pointers instead of one. Um, and uh, reverse iteration then becomes a big problem because in database workloads, uh, users expect, and because a B tree gives you uh, the ability to iterate both forwards and backwards on an index. So one of the most common queries is select star from events, order by ID descending limit 10. That gives you the, the most uh, recent 10 events. Um, and if you have a singly linked skip list, which uh, doesn't support reverse iteration, it's very hard to do that. Um, and so we invented this reverse iterator, uh, which I'll leave as a homework assignment to figure out kind of how that works, um, which lets you iterate the skip list backwards and amortize uh, linear time. Um, and it's about 1.2 to 1.5 times slower, depending on how that skip list picture I, I showed looks.